desensitizing. Uh, it's good to kind of go back over things. Uh, they say that unless a human being hears something 16 times, <laughs> we don't retain it. I'm, I'm not sure about that. I probably need it more than 16 times. I'm getting old. But it's good to recap. So we remember what we've talked about. Creation, good. The fall of angels and men, not good. Pride, disobedience, death. The incarnation, the word becomes flesh and dwells among us. God assumes a human nature. Why? To take it to the cross. Redemption. The passion, death, and resurrection of the Lord. What's our part in all of it? Well, we have a part in every bit of it. We have a part in creation. We certainly experience the fall, sin. We have the experience of the incarnation, God drawing close to us. And we participate in the fruits of redemption. Each one of us in our own life, in our own place, in our own way, should make Christ present. After all, we are Christians. We are those who bear Christ within us. And so in this immortal combat, this spiritual warfare, we have to enter into the fray armed with the power of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I have cautioned you along the way uh, not to get carried away too far one way or the other, to be well balanced. It's very important to be well balanced. Now, please don't go home and tell your pastor that Father Karapi says the devil is under every rock. And, and don't be worried. You know, the, yes, these things are real. But as I've told you, as a Christian and as a Catholic, as long as you stay out of serious sin, as long as you live your Christian faith, all right, maybe you can't live it perfectly, but as best you can, you're going to be all right. The devil's like a vicious dog on a short chain. Don't get in range, okay? It wouldn't be wise to get too close to a 200-pound Rottweiler who isn't feeling well this morning, or maybe he's a little hungry. And we just wouldn't be smart to do that. That's mortal sin. That's what it means to get in range of the devil. That's the only way the devil can hurt you, is through sin. So don't give in to that. Don't give him permission to have power over in your life. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you, as sacred scripture says. Let me read to you from a, oh, it's a, one of the appendix in uh, Father Gabriel Amorth's book, an exorcist tells a story published by Ignatius Press. Uh, St. Teresa is speaking to all of us. She's a doctor of the church. There are only 33 doctors of the church. In 2,000 years of Christianity, we only have 33. Out of all the thousands of saints that there are, there are only 33 doctors. Uh, one of them is St. Teresa of Avila, Teresa of Jesus. Listen to what she has to say. If this Lord is powerful, as I see that he is, and I know that he is, and if the devils are his slaves, and there's no doubt about that because it's a matter of faith, what evil can they do to me since I am a servant of this Lord and King? Why shouldn't I have the fortitude to engage in combat with all of hell? I took a cross in my hand, and it seemed to me truly that God gave me courage because in a short while I saw that I was another person and I wouldn't feel bodily com combat with all of them. For I thought that with that cross I would easily conquer them all. And so I said, come on now all of you for being a servant of the Lord, I want to see what you can do to me. There was no doubt in my opinion that they were afraid of me, for I remained so calm and so unafraid of all of them. All the fears that I usually felt left me even to this very day, for although I sometimes saw them, as I shall relate later, I no longer had hardly any fear of them. Rather, it seemed that they were afraid of me. I was left with a mastery over them truly given by the Lord of all. I, may, I pay no more attention to them than to flies. I think they're such cowards that when they observe that they are esteemed but little, their strength leaves them. These enemies don't know how to attack head on, save those whom they see surrender to them, or when God permits them to do so, 
for the greater good of his ser servants whom they tempt and torment. May it please his majesty the Lord that we fear him who we ought to fear and understand that more harm can come to us from one venial sin than from all hell put together. For this is so. Now that's a doctor of the church, St. Teresa of Avila. And that's what she has to say about it. Remember I told you one night the devil appeared to her in a horrible form hovering over her bed. She woke up out of a dead sleep and saw him standing there like a monster. And she said, oh, it's only you. And she turned over and went back to sleep. <laughs> That's a good example, you know. So listen, all this talk about spiritual combat and all this talk about the reality of the battle between heaven and hell, between the demons and the good angels, <clears throat> it is true, but don't let it worry you. You know, don't go home and lose sleep tonight, all right? So listen, you're the children of God, and your Father loves you, and he has given to you at your disposal great and powerful weapons. Make sure that you use them, and don't give away your freedom to the enemy. All right, this last talk, is going to be on the power of the cross of Christ in this spiritual combat. Now, for ages and ages since the original sin, the devil held a certain mastery over humanity because of sin. That's the only way he can enslave us is through sin. And we, ha we do that ourselves. We have a free will. We don't have to sin, but we choose to. And that's how we give away our freedom. That's how the devil gains mastery over souls. That's how, indeed, we can lose our eternal salvation. How did Jesus overturn the reign of sin, Satan, and death? By the power of his cross. He took his human nature, which he had united to his divine nature, the two natures subsisting in the person of the eternal word, he brought that nature to the cross. He suffered, he died, and he rose on the third day. Why? For us. We were in need of a savior. And so he took upon himself our sins, and he nailed them to the cross, and he led off the devils as captives. He took the sting out of death, as the fathers of the church have said and as we say in our prayers. We enter into the life and mission of Jesus Christ. The day that you and I were baptized, we were brought into the mystery of the life and mission of the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what it means to be a baptized person. The servant is no better than his master. The master said, where I am, there my servant will be. Where is he? Lifted up on a cross. He said, it is necessary that I be lifted up in order to draw all men to myself. The cross. The cross is the crossroads where all roads cross. From my reconversion to the faith, I had an intuitive understanding that this mystery of redemptive suffering was something very important for every human being. If the church doesn't have an answer to the big question, why, why suffering? Why me, Lord? Why did my husband die young of cancer? Why is my son in jail? Why is my daughter an alcoholic? Why, why, why? That question reverberates down through the ages. A pained question that echoes in every human heart in one way or another. Why does a good God permit so much evil? Once Dr. Billy Graham who was a great Christian evangelist. I respect him very much. 
he was on television being interviewed by David Frost. And David Frost said, Dr. Graham, how is it that a God who is love, a God who is so good, how can such a good God allow so much evil? And Dr. Graham, being an honest man, said what intelligent, educated people often have to say. I don't know, David. I don't know. Now, Protestant theology does not provide an answer to that. There's a difference here. Now, actually, he, Dr. Graham responded correctly. He says, I don't know. That is a mystery. And he's right. It is a mystery. The mystery of why God permits evil. In other words, why do bad things happen to good people? Why me? I've always been a good Catholic. I go to church all the time. I don't live in mortal sin. Why do bad things happen to me? Inevitably, everyone who draws closer to the Lord is ultimately given a greater share in his cross. You ever, you ever notice that? Like, maybe you had a kind of um, reconversion in your faith or you got more serious about it when you hit a certain age. It often happens that uh, adults, uh, when they get about in their 30s or around 30 or late 20s, they get married. It's, it coincides with that time when the brain starts functioning rather than hormones. It kind of co coincides with that period of time when your brain actually starts to govern what you do rather than hormones. That often governs what people do until they get well into their 20s or even 30s, and some of them never learn. But then we begin to get serious about our faith, maybe, start, maybe we even go to daily mass, say the rosary, and inevitably those people encounter violent opposition from the enemy. I can't, I can't tell you how many people have come to me, but Father, I've gotten serious about my faith. I now go to Mass every day. Why, I pray the rosary. I wear a brown scapular. I believe everything the church teaches, and everything has started to go wrong. My family thinks I'm a nut. They think I'm a religious fanatic. That's a very, very common complaint of people who become serious about their faith. Well, why do these things happen? Well, it's logical. When you're living in sin, you're no threat to the devil's kingdom. You get out of sin and you start living in grace, you're an enemy. You start doing some damage, and so you encounter opposition. The cross cannot be avoided. There are many, many, many people who would like to be with Jesus in the power and glory of his resurrection, but there are very few who are willing to stand there in the shame and darkness and pain of the cross. Jesus has many friends in his resurrection, but darn few in his crucifixion. I've got a real revelation for you. On my liturgical calendar, Good Friday always comes before Easter Sunday. How's that, rocket scientists? Hmm? You, you, can, you figure that out? I mean, you know that? You, sure, yeah, you know. Uh, please read my lips. Good Friday comes before Easter Sunday. You got it? You know what it means. It means no pain, no gain. Athletes know that. No pain, no gain. Oh, you don't want to work out? You don't want to work till it hurts? No pain, no gain. You get knocked flat on your butt. And in this spiritual combat, no pain, no gain, no cross, no crown, no gall, no glory. And so, as Christians, we have a share in the cross of Christ. Padre Pio used to say, Jesus gives 
the biggest share of his cross to his best friend. And some of you, his best friends, might quickly think, I wish he wouldn't be so chummy with me. <laughs> St. Teresa of Avila, who I just quoted in that passage, one day was going through the countryside in Spain. She was dr driving in a horse and wagon in a carriage, and she was very sick. Uh, most of the saints had a great deal of suffering in their lives, physical, emotional, spiritual. And St. Teresa was not unlike all the great saints. She had all kinds of aches and pains and illnesses, and, and she was very sick with a terrible migraine headache, and she was going bouncing through the countryside. It was rainy. It was cold and damp, a miserable day. And I've been in that part of Spain, and it, is a, it can be cold and uh, just awful weather. Well, it was one such day. The wagon wheel hit a rut and dumped the carriage over, and it just put her right into a ditch full of mud. She was cold, sick, covered with mud all over her nice Carmelite religious habit. And she looked up, and she said, Oh, Lord, if you treat your friends thus, no wonder you have so few of them. You see, even the saints, you know, had their patience tested. You know, they, they weren't infinite in their ability to carry the cross. You know, they, they had limitations. So uh, don't be too upset that you have limitations and that I have limitations. Uh, approach it with humility, and a sense of humor goes a long way. You know, I, I found out that a lot of the saints had a great sense of humor. A sense of humor in the face of suffering really is a powerful ally in your struggle. The Padre Pio suffered for 50 years with the stigmata. He had tremendous pain from the wounds of Christ, which he had in his hands and his feet and his side. 50 years. One day, they had a big party for him on the 50th anniversary of his stigmata. And a man came up to him and said, Oh, God bless you, Padre Pio. May he grant you 50 more. And Padre Pio looked at him in horror and said, What did I ever do to you? <laughs> One day, a rather fancy rich lady came to the monastery. She was dressed up in very fine clothes. and. Padre Pio was used to the country people. He'd come from a, a family of poor farmers, and he was used to the women coming to church in their old black dresses and their shawls, very poor people. But this lady was a wealthy lady, maybe nobility, and she was dressed in her finery. And she situated herself in the corridor between the, the friary and the monastery church, and she waylaid Padre Pio as he came through. And she grabbed him by the sleeve of his habit and said, Now, Padre Pio, today is my birthday. Today is my 70th birthday. Now say something nice to me. And he smiled at her sweetly, and he leaned over and whispered in her ear, Death is near. <laughs> and he walked off. <laughs> yeah. It is reported that another lady who was large. She could have played defensive tackle for the Green Bay Packers. Very large. Approached him and said, Now, Padre Pio, what is it going to take to make me holy? And he looked her up and down, and he said, About 16 lengths. <laughs> and then he walked off. <laughs> but he was nice to her, though. He smiled when he said it. You say, oh, that's cruel. Well, you, you had to be there. <laughs> but many of the saints, they were not sourpusses. They were not dour, miserable human beings. They, they were people that could laugh. Uh, I have known some extremely holy people. I've known a couple people who will probably be canonized saints in due time. Uh, 
I, I, I mean, I don't know them well, but I, I met Mother Teresa, talked with her. She was at my ordination. Uh, the Holy Father, John Paul II, the founder of my own religious congregation, Father Jim Flanagan. I met some, they might not be canonized. Oh, I think Mother Teresa and the Holy Father will be for sure. But I've known many good, holy people. Every single one of them seemed to have a pretty good sense of humor. They all experienced a lot of pain in their life. And they found that that sense of humor helped them, helped them to get through it. The devil hates you to be happy. He hates it. He doesn't want you to have any peace or joy. I, I think that some comedians like Bob Hope, and as long as the humor is wholesome, you know, and, and nothing impure, anything, but I think they help humanity. You know, they say that laughing even helps cancer. People recover sometimes from cancer when they have regular humor. They've done research on it, and they've actually had periods of time where they were given a half hour a day of, of, of things to make them laugh you know, comedy shows or whatever, and they found that it contributed significantly to their healing. When I was in that very, very dark period in my life, when I had lost everything in the world, um, there is a pedagogical and purifying principle at work in human suffering. I had gone from a poor boy to a very wealthy man. I had achieved the American dream. I went on dates with movie stars. I went to parties with rock stars. I drove a Ferrari through Beverly Hills, lived in a million dollar mansion on the beach, had a yacht, on and on and on. And then I lost it all through my own stupidity. I almost died. I lost everything. I became so desolate. For three years, I was absolutely desolate. I had nothing. I lost everything. I was homeless in the streets of Los Angeles after having been a multimillionaire. Now, it's one thing to grow up poor and to stay poor all your life. You can be happy without having very much, but it's another thing to grow up poor, become very wealthy, and then to become absolutely destitute and be homeless in the street with the clothes on your back, no place to live, nothing to eat, not a nickel in your pocket, not a friend in the world. Darkness and desolation become your daily companions. I've been there and done that. Three years of pain. Terrible pain. I remember one day stopping in the streets in Los Angeles. It was so horrible. <clears throat> I stopped and said to myself out loud, what is this? What is this? The pain, emotional pain, was so intense why I could scarcely stand it. The threat, the specter of suicide hung over me for years. I never attempted it. Uh, I grew up in the old church when they said, if you kill yourself, you go to hell. <clears throat> and somehow I believed it. So I wasn't willing to go that far, no matter how miserable I was. So I never attempted it. But I was terribly depressed, terribly anxious, in pain, in very great pain. I, I remember coming home to my mother's house, and it went from bad to worse, even though that was a good place. But the devil knew his grip was loosening on me. And he redoubled his efforts to do me in. I remember one night, I was in terrible emotional pain. I, I went to bed and I slept, and I, now I don't put great stock in dreams and so forth. Most dreams are just the product of our own human imagination. They're perfectly natural and normal. But every once in a while, it is possible for God or the devil to speak through dreams, to influence us through dreams. Most of them, the vast majority of dreams, they come from our own psyche. They're natural. That's just totally normal. Once in a while, though, from God, from the devil, it can and does happen. 
Well, in the, in the depths of my darkness, my pain, <clears throat> I had a hilarious dream. It was stu It was silly. I can't even recount it because it, it wouldn't sound funny. But this, this picture, this spectacle, and I, la I woke myself up. I laughed so hard that I woke myself up and my stomach hurt from laughing so hard. And I felt so good all day as a result of some of these things you discern by their effects. I have no doubt that some angel, maybe my guardian angel, had somehow transmitted this hilarious dream to me, which came in, in, in the, I saw some outlandish character in a duck marsh with some wild duck decoy, decoying ducks down. The ducks came down, took a look at that, and started laughing out loud. And I saw this ridiculous cartoon kind of, and I howled, and something changed inside of me. Uh, the darkness was dispersed for a while. That didn't come from the devil. I don't even think it came from me. I don't know where I could have conjured up something as wild as that. I think I had a little help. Another time when I was in Europe studying, I was about to be ordained a priest. I was within 60 days of ordination. It was all set. All our paperwork had gone in. I was approved. The Pope was going to ordain me a priest. Wow. Then one Friday, I came down terrible pain, and I had to go to the hospital, and I needed emergency surgery. And I went into this, the university I went to had a major medical teaching facility. And so the, a doctor, a surgeon came out with five interns and 12 student nurses to watch the surgery. It was painful and it was humiliating. Well, they anesthetized me with a local anesthetic and it didn't take, and they began to cut. And the pain was so horrible, I couldn't speak. I couldn't tell the doctor. He's saying in Spanish. I, I didn't speak Spanish very well, but the doctor is going in a very calm voice like doctors do. Now, how's that? Is that? Oh, does that feel better now? And how's that? Do you have any pain? I, I was in shock. My mouth wouldn't move. And, you know, he could have been murdering me right on the spot. I wouldn't have said anything. In the first place, I couldn't have thought of it in Spanish. In the second place, my mouth wouldn't move. Well, it finished, and I was almost in shock. Actually, during the surgery, I was drifting in and out of shock. Later, I had to go back for a series of quasi-surgical procedures where they opened the wound so that it would heal properly. No anesthetic, no nothing. I was surprised they didn't give me a bullet to bite on. <laughs> I remember in the middle of the surgery, I, I, I imagined that I heard John Wayne's voice. <laughs> now, come on, buckaroo. <laughs> Be a man about it. You can take it. My friend and I, who were studying together in that foreign country, we laugh, we, I was in terrible pain for, for two weeks. We would laugh about it. We would make up jokes, and, and, and it relieved the pain. You know, it took my mind off it for a while. And time passed. I was worried I wouldn't be ordained because I wouldn't be able to go. I wouldn't be well in time. But everything turned out well. Oh, I was healed wonderfully. My grandmother, while I was on the operating table, my grandmother, 94 years old, Rosary praying daily communicant lady all her life. My grandmother was in her last suffering. She died. Uh, she suffered and she died as I was on the operating table. There's a, an affinity. There's a closeness. Something going on. I don't know. It's not just a coincidence. My grandmother helped me get to the priesthood. That suffering helped me get to the priesthood. There is not only an instructive dimension in suffering united to the suffering of Christ, there's a purifying dimension to it. Purgatory is the final purification. The cross purifies us. It capacitates us to receive grace, not just for ourselves, 
but for other people as well. I told you how my father, after he came, he heard me preach. He went to confession to me, and he said in total sincerity, I wish I could have been a better father. I tell you, God the Father heard that prayer a million times over. My father, who was a very, he wasn't a big man, but he was a powerful man. He was a great athlete when he was young. Uh, he was a boxer, played baseball, basketball, a rough guy, one of the roughest guys I ever knew. Well, my dad, in a couple short years, went from 220 pounds, muscular, strong man. He's, he's still alive, barely, about 80 pounds. I saw him a couple weeks ago. He's been suffering ever since he said that to me. I wish I could have been a better father. What happened? It's like God opened a sanctuary and invited him into a very sacred place. It is the place where God meets man, where heaven reaches down to earth and earth up to heaven. It is a place where north, south, east, and west meet, the intersection of the beams of the cross. That is where power is to be found. And so my dad entered the sanctuary of the cross of Christ, and his entire life, everything, centered on the cross. From that moment on, almost 40 surgeries have come and gone since then. Three open heart surgeries, valve replacement, surgeries on his spine, surgeries on his hands, very painful, surgeries on his eyes, one after the other. He scarcely had a moment's rest from pain. Piles of medication, pills on, on the table, none of them relieved the pain. His entire life was spent in and out of the hospital. It still is. In between preaching a couple years ago in Lent, I was on an airplane between every mission, and I preach all of Lent every year. I never have a week off during Lent. I go every single week preaching. In between, I was flying to Los Angeles every week to see my dad. He hung on the edge of death. He's been in and out of that never-never land, that balance point between life and death countless times. I saw him a couple weeks ago. He was in the little hospital bed that he has in a corner of his house. On the wall, the rosary I gave him, I was the Holy Father gave me that rosary the day he ordained me. I gave it to my dad. He has it on the wall. He prays with it. The picture of the Holy Father's hands on my head when he ordained me. A little picture of the Blessed Mother. That's his entire world. And in the middle of it all, a large crucifix to remind him of the meaning of life, to remind him of his identity as a Christian. We have heard the term identity crisis. Priests in recent times have had identity crises. Religious have had identity crises. They leave their vocation. The priests take off. Married people have identity crises. They say, oh, well, the ma it's, no lo it's no longer relevant for me. I can't relate to you anymore. And they get divorced. They leave. They have an identity crisis. People don't know where they came from. People don't know where they're headed. People don't know where they are. That's a good definition of being lost, an identity crisis. We don't know the meaning of life. Where am I? Who am I? I have one piece of advice for anybody and everybody who ever has an identity crisis. Take a good long look at a crucifix. There you will see Jesus Christ, true God and true man. If you want to know who God is, look at a crucifix. And there you will see the Father's only Son. Jesus said, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. 
You'll find out about God when you look at the crucifix, about his love, his sacrificial love. You say, well, I want to know about humanity. I want to know about my own nature. Look at a crucifix, for Jesus is not only true God, he is true man. Why did God put you and I on the earth? You know why? To become other Christs. Now, there is only one Christ. There is only one Jesus. There is only one Savior. There is only one mediator between God and men, the man Jesus Christ. But Jesus wills to incorporate us into the great work of redemption. And so we are taken up in Christ. That's the meaning of baptism. The old man dies, the new is reborn. We're taken up in Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives within me. I live, I move, I have my being in him. That's my identity. So if you ever forget who you are, look at a crucifix, and that will remind you of the meaning of life. Why a cross? God could have done it any way he pleased. Now, Almighty God could have snapped his divine fingers, and that would have been more than sufficient to redeem an infinity of worlds. For after all, he is God. He's all-powerful. Snap his fingers, redemption is finished. We're all home free. He didn't choose to do it that way. He did it the way he did it. He chose to do it on a cross to show the height and depth and breadth of his sacrificial love. Talk is cheap. You say, I love you. That's a nice sentiment. Maybe it's true. I say to you, you wonderful people, you good children of God, I love you dearly. And you say, yeah, talk is cheap, Father. What is authentic love? Authentic love is tested love. As a sign of love, man and woman get married. When they're, when they're young, everything's beautiful. You know, you're, you just, you can't wait to see each other. There's chemistry at work. You know, every once in a while, they, some distressed pastor, when I'm visiting, will say, would you talk to a young couple about to get married? They're coming over tonight for the pre cana counseling. Would you talk to them? I don't think they have a clue about marriage or love. And so, the, brush, the blushing bride-to-be and the groom show up at the rectory. And instead of the benign, smiling face of the pastor, <laughs> they find me. <laughs> and I will say to them, so you're going to be married. That's great. Wonderful. You must be in love. Oh, well, yeah, Father. We're in love, you know. That's why we're getting married. Great. Tell me, what is love? Well, you know, Father. Love. We got feelings for each other. Hey, man. Feelings are up and feelings are down and feelings are all around. It's like a yo-yo. The devil's pulling the strings. If all you've got is feelings... You're in trouble. What else? And the blushing bride-to-be might say, Ooh, we've got chemistry. <laughs> Honey, that can blow up. <laughs> Come on, what else is love? They never get it. So how about this? If you love someone... You desire the highest and best thing for the sake of that person. And nobody can disagree with that. If you love someone, you want the highest and best thing for the one you love. Well, yeah, okay, yes. Okie dokie. What's that? Well, you know, uh, we want to have a, a good job. Okay. A nice house. Great. 
some children. Better yet, a doggy named Spot? <laughs> Early retirement? Okay, good. Not bad things. All right, what else? What else? Well, come on, Father, what else could there be? And then you just give him the punchline. How about heaven? If you love someone, and love is desiring the highest and best thing for the sake of the one you love, do you desire eternal salvation for that person you love? And are you willing, are you willing to do anything and everything to get them there? Talk is mighty cheap. And we say, I love you, I love you. The pastor loves his flock, and the bride loves the groom, and everybody loves everybody. And then we get down to the battle. And we find out who loves who. When the cross looms in the immediate future. And husbands desert their wives, Wives desert their husbands, and pastors desert their flocks, and religious desert their congregations and their vocations. Why? Very often, because pain and suffering confront them. It isn't easy to be a husband or wife today, is it? It isn't easy to be a parent today. It isn't easy to be a young person today. Hard, hard, cruel world. It isn't easy to be a priest today either. Brutal. None of it's easy. Not easy for you, not easy for me. But what are we going to do? Cut and run? I remember when I used to box. I was a pretty good boxer, and I rarely lost. But I remember a couple of fights that were tough. I remember one in particular, going all the way to the finals of the Golden Gloves in the Eastern region, all the tough guys from New York and New Jersey, the whole Eastern seaboard. And I got right to the finals as a middleweight, the equivalent of what we'd call a middleweight. And, and I ran into a real tough guy. The first round, I knew I was in trouble. I knew this guy was better than me. He was stronger than me, and he was quicker than me. And I after about another round of it, thoughts began to go through my mind, I better lay down. <laughs> I could get hurt. <laughs> but to be honest with you, those thoughts didn't stay very long. I had the idea, he's going to have to kill me. He's going to have to kill me. He may beat me. Fair and square, he'll deserve to win. But I ain't going to lay down in this fight or any other one. He will have to kill me flat out dead. Now, what about you? In this immortal combat, what about you in this war to end all wars? What about you fighting for the salvation of your own soul, not to mention souls of your children, your grandchildren, all your friends and relatives. You're going to throw the fight? You're taking a beating. I sympathize with you. It'd be easy to lay down. Who could blame you? You're bloody. You're bruised. You're battered. Why, it's already the 15th round. Who could blame you? Don't lay down. Don't throw the fight. Don't give up. God is with you. And if God is for you, who can be against you? You and I are absolutely, essentially, irrevocably important in this battle. You have been given souls that you are accountable for. I have been given souls that I will be held accountable for. I am in the arena. I am slugging it out with a superior force. It's a mismatch. 
but, but, God Almighty is in my corner. I am a temple of the Holy Spirit. I am weak, but it is in we when I am weak that I am made strong. St. Paul said it is in weakness that God's mighty power is brought to perfection. It is when I am weak and precisely when I am weak that I am strong. Now this is a major principle in the spiritual life. Today we have another horrendous sin. We have abortion, but at the other end of the spectrum we have euthanasia in a senseless culture that doesn't understand the value, the salvific value of redemptive suffering would have us put our elderly out of their misery like old dogs. Well, I'm telling you that our elderly have been placed at the focal point of power. They have been set at the pinnacle of power for they are set on the cross of Christ. And that is indeed the pinnacle of power, for it is where you have the greatest possibilities. Why? No greater love hath a man or woman, but that they lay down their life for their friends and their enemy. The greatest power, the force, is redemptive suffering. I spent three years of my life, day and night, praying and studying this subject. It was my doctoral thesis, my licentiate thesis as well, tending to answer the why. Why does a good God permit evil in order to bring a greater good out of it. Look at a crucifix if you don't believe me. It is at once the worst and the greatest thing ever. The worst because it is deicide. God experienced death through his human nature, part of the doctrine of the faith. Look it up. Jesus is God. He experienced death through his human nature. Creatures lift up the creator on the cross. And yet it is the greatest thing in history the good of the redemption. The captives are set free. It is that principle, the paradox of the cross, that it is written on every page of Christian history. There has never been a saint or good Christian who has not suffered. Every one of us, in some way, fills up in our own human life what is lacking in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body the church, Colossians 1.24. St. Paul proclaimed that. It is now my joy. It is now my joy to suffer for you as I fill up in my own poor human flesh that which is yet to be consummated in the sufferings of Christ for the sake of his body, the church. I have never been a father in the natural order. I, I have no biological children. But in the last couple of years, God has given me a spiritual intimation of what it is like to love a child. Now, many of you know what that is. Imagine God our Father. Now, we, in all of our imperfection, love our children very much. God, in his absolute, infinite perfection, loves his children, each one of them, in a way so profound that we can scarcely fathom it. Imagine if you had an only child, and that child was killed prematurely. My little sister, when I came home from the Army, 1970, 71, 14 years old, just entered high school, went to a football game Friday night with some of her friends. 
My mother had had a premonition and warned her and ordered her not to go. The way that teenagers sometimes do, she snuck off, went anyway. On the way home from the game, the car crashed, hit a tree on a country road. Four of the five in the car were killed instantly, my sister among them, 14 years old. Why? Why does a good God allow so much pain? I was in college. I got a and My sister said, you better come. Mary Ann's been in a car accident. Come as quick as you can. I went straight to the hospital. Had that anxiety, you don't know. Oh, well, growing up, kids have a lot of bumps and bruises. She's probably OK, but then a nagging doubt. I walked in and I saw my uncle, my mother's sister, brother. I walked in the lobby of the hospital and I knew immediately she didn't make it. I went into a side room and there was my mother. And on her face was etched the pain of a universe. Pain of a parent who's lost her youngest child, the last one home. Now imagine the pain of God at the loss of any of his children. And you say, but God can't experience pain. God is God. He's impassable, incapable of pain. And I tell you, in some mystical way, God our Father, through his Son, through the power of the incarnation, the union of divinity and humanity, God somehow mystically experiences that pain of a parent, grieving, worrying of a child. In the last couple of years, God's put it in my heart. I have such an anxiety for certain individuals that I scarcely had a night of sleep in two years because of it. A, a, a worry, a driving force, a compulsion almost to pray incessantly that not one of them be lost. There's a war for souls raging. And most of us don't have a clue or could care less that it's going on. I tell you that if you want to please your Heavenly Father, contribute to the salvation of his beloved children. If you want to do something that will go down, not just in history, but for all eternity, as a great and noble thing, then unite yourself with Jesus Christ on his cross and allow him to use your physical, emotional, and spiritual suffering to bring down grace on his little ones. Many, many a night I wake up in the dark. In the faces of those I once knew in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, in high school, all over the world, those faces come to me. And I see them clear as the day that I was last with them. And I am moved to pray for them. I am moved to beg God to be merciful. I am moved to do penance for them. I am moved to ask Our Lady to help them. I place them in the Immaculate Heart of Mary, a safe haven, a mystical garden where God delights to dwell. I turn to the angels. I turn to the saints. I turn to the sacraments. I turn to the sacramentals. And there I wage war. There I wage war. There I encounter Satan and all his minions, their claws grasping for souls. And there, God Almighty and Jesus, the Lion of the tribe of Judah, says, This far you'll come, and no far farther shall you come, enemy. 
adversary. We are at war, and our battle is not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the hosts of wickedness, the rulers of this age of darkness, the fallen angels, the devil. We are at war. And it behooves you and I to take up the weapons, spiritual weapons, the shield of faith, the sword of the spirit, the word of God. Take all the weapons and don't quit. Don't quit until God uses up the last breath in you. And with your last breath, Praise Jesus and his holy mother, and with your last breath, offer it, offer it all for the salvation of souls, and the glory of our Father's kingdom. And if you do that, I promise you before God Almighty, when it's over, when you run the race to the finish line, when you've fought the good fight, oh, you'll stand before God, all right, but not in fear, triumphant. And he'll smile at you as a father welcoming his beloved child. And you'll hear those beautiful words. Well done, my soldier, my warrior, my good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of your master's house. God bless you. First question, does the devil also move in on good people who have a tendency towards scrupulosity? Uh, does, can the devil or does the devil cause it to become full-blown? What can be done to prevent this? Well, listen, once again, don't overdo the, the devil business, but can the devil, is the devil involved with everybody? Yes. Even good people? Yes. Uh, now. Not every thought that comes into our head is from the enemy. I mean, we, we, have, we have enough problems of our own in our, in our ways of, of thinking and not reasoning things properly. Scrupulosity can be one of those problems. Uh, we're we're going to have to uh, quiet down so that I'm the only one talking. I think we have a, a mob scene over at the salt table. All right, we'll let, allow the people to grab their salt. Yeah, okay. You know, somebody asked, <clears throat> why, but why do we bless salt? Why, why bother to bless? Well, it's a common element the church has used for centuries as the matter for sacramental. Uh, as you well know, uh, salt stays around longer than water, right? You sprinkle holy water and it evaporates quickly, correct? Salt hangs around. A little bit longer. Now, sure, rain can come and it gets washed into the ground and so forth. Fine. But it lasts a little bit longer. So that's a practical reason why we use salt. All right. Scrupulosity. You know what that is. You're constantly worried that you're not doing the right thing. Oh, am I committing sins? How bad are these sins? On and on and on. And you torture yourself. <clears throat> yeah, that can happen. What's the best antidote for it? A good spiritual director. You say, well, I can't find one. Well, I, I sympathize with that. There aren't too many of them around. But you just pray and you try to be well balanced and just don't get carried away too far off any deep ends. Balance is a very important thing, a very godly thing. All right. What will heaven be like? <clears throat> well, I haven't been there yet. <clears throat> It'll be great. Heaven is the immediate vision of God. 
the intellect is elevated in a very special way by a very special grace. The intellect becomes, capa it becomes capacitated to see God directly. In other words, we can see God directly, not through some mediated way. Now, we say we can see God in nature. We can see God in the sacraments, in a holy person. We're able to, in a sense, see God. But seeing God immediately, directly, face to face, well, that's a miracle. That requires a change in our intellect, an elevation through grace where we're capacitated to see God immediately, not, not mediated uh, by means of sense-perceptible things. It'll be great. Uh, the greater the degree of charity you attain in this life, the greater sanctity you'll have forever in heaven, the greater closeness you will have to God. Now, everyone in heaven is perfectly happy. Uh, but is everybody the same in heaven? No. No. Uh, you know, St. Francis of Assisi is going to have a higher place than most of us. They're not all the same. Now, is everybody in heaven perfectly happy? Oh, yeah. Uh, for, I'll give you an example. You can have a, a shot glass or a big beer stein and fill them both up. They're both still full. Okay? And that's the way it'll be in heaven. You're completely happy. Your capacity for happiness may be less than somebody else's, but you are completely happy. Completely. You lack nothing. You lack nothing. And so don't worry that heaven will have some kind of deficiencies. Now, I'll guarantee you, and I know this, I asked the good Lord one time, I said, Lord, I'm not going to have to sit around for eternity playing a harp, am I? I'm no good at that stuff. I'll be bored. Believe me, that's not what it's about. It'll be a joy beyond your wildest dream. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard what God has in store for those who love him. It'll be the greatest thing you could possibly imagine. A lady asked me what I thought heaven would be like. Her answer was, I, I don't care what you said. You can't get me to change my mind. She said, I feel I will have the most beautiful home in heaven because I will deserve it because I am very good. <laughs> I told her, <laughs> I told her nothing, nothing man-made will be there. She didn't care. <laughs> well, okay. <laughs> well, Jesus said, there are many mansions in my father's house. Well, we don't know exactly um, what it's going to be, but there probably won't be a need for contractors and mechanics and carpenters to construct mansions in heaven. They're already there waiting for you. It'll be great. Take my word for it. You said the effectiveness, grace of a sacrament, can be limited by the receptivity of the person receiving it. What about confirmation, which can be only received once, or, or marriage, uh, or I might add holy orders? And, and that's a good question. If your resistance through sin and so forth blocks the fullness of grace, does it or is it ever available to that person? Now, that's a very, very good and theological question, and it's, and it's very relevant, especially today. Let's say a young person uh, is not particularly religious at the age of 14 or 15, like most of us weren't, and they're going to receive confirmation. And if what I said that you know, things are received according to the Moses Street. It, did they get anything out of it? Yes, they received the sacrament. What about if a person receives the sacrament of matrimony and they're in mortal sin? <laughs> they can't receive any grace. What happens? Do they receive the sacrament? Yes, but it's dead. The grace of the sacrament isn't going to help you. Why? You're dead in mortal sin. Well, what happens then? We're, we're, we're sunk. We'll never have sanctifying grace operating through that sacrament of matrimony. The sacrament can be resuscitated. As soon as you go to confession and you're back in the state of grace, boom, the sacrament kicks in. Same with confirmation. Same with baptism. Same with all the sacraments that you receive only once. You, oh, yes, they, they can go dormant. They can not operate when you're in mortal sin but once you go to confession, once you're restored to grace, they're resuscitated. That's a word we use. The sacrament is resuscitated. 
and once again, it breathes life into your life. If you have been away from confession for a long time, where do you start? With the first commandment, and then the second, and then the third, and that, that's how you do it. You examine your conscience. I was away 20 years. I said, bless me, Father, I have sinned. It's 20 years since my last confession. I had no trouble whatsoever making a good confession. The Holy Spirit helps you. You go through the sacraments, or rather the commandments. One, two, three, four. And, hey, what happens, though? Let's say you've been away for a long time. You can't remember it all. You know, 20 years. Do you think I could remember every sin I committed? I can't count that high. But I examined my conscience, and I, and I was honest, and I made a good confession. Now, yeah, but what if you left some out? They're automatically forgiven. You mean even if you can't remember them and you don't confess them, they're automatically forgiven? Either all your sins are forgiven or none of them are. So if you make a good confession, an integral confession, if you confess all the serious sins that the Holy Spirit brings to consciousness, you're honest, in other words. All of your sins, including the ones you forgot, all of them are forgiven. Okay? And that's how it works. That's how the sacrament works. All right. Can you make a comparison or parallel to, to Catholic teaching and the Protestant view of generational curses or possession and so forth? Um, well, I, I, I'm going to tell you this. <clears throat> Good Catholic teaching on the subject and good Protestant teaching on the subject in that area, they're very consistent. Uh, I talked with a lot of good Protestant, evangelical Protestant pastors who were doing uh, healing and deliverance before it caught on, so to speak, in the Catholic Church. And they learned a lot. They really had learned a lot through experience. Um, Father Gabriel Amorth, in that book that I mentioned, An Exorcist Tells a Story, had high praise for a lot of the good ev evangelical Protestant uh, pastors who were doing these things in, out of a sense of pastoral duty and mercy to the people who were very severely afflicted. Um, it's very consistent. Is there such a thing as a curse? You better believe it. There is such a thing. I mean, can it actually work? Yes. Well, what if somebody, like, let's say some witch, somebody doesn't like me, and they, you know, cast a spell or put a curse on me. Well, if I'm living the way I should, if I'm in a state of grace, I have the sacraments working for me, what's going to happen? It's going to bounce off. It'll return to sender. That's what happens. Okay? Okay which is another reason to remain in a state of grace. But the people who are not in a state of grace are vulnerable to those things. They become ripe material uh, for these curses, spells, hexes, and so forth, voodoo. Uh, is that merely superstition? No. It, it's real. It is scary. The practitioners of it are involved in the occult. The devil is behind it all. He's the power behind it. But for a good Christian, a good Catholic, who's living in a state of grace, uh, they can curse you all they want. But in most cases, unless God permits it, remember I gave four basic ways that you can uh, get in trouble with these things. The first one is an innocent person. It can be permitted by God that they suffer, that, that they can be allowed to suffer that way, to be persecuted by the enemy. God can permit it. Why? for the sanctification of that person, to make him a saint, in other words. Uh, somebody said, look, uh, you said the devil can't hurt us. What about, uh, excuse me, <coughs> what about, um, thank you. <laughs> what about Padre Pio? Uh, the devil used to beat him up. St. <clears throat> Francis had it happen. St. Anthony of the Desert, that the demons physically beat him up. What about that? Well, God permitted it. They were innocent, but God permitted his servants to be tested. Uh, St. Francis was out in a hermitage in the wilderness one day and filled with zeal for the Lord. He said, okay. He said, I'm a servant of God, and all your demons are threatening me. 
You're trying to intimidate me and scare me. You're bullies. Here I am, little Francis. Come and get some. That's St. Francis. You know, he said, come on. They ran. They ran. They operate through fear and intimidation. You have nothing to fear if you are in a state of grace, and that is an eminently good reason to stay in a state of grace. Believe me. That reason alone is a great reason not to commit a mortal sin. I don't want to give the ugly enemy any power over me. Okay. Does the church only name <coughs> three archangels? Well, generally speaking, in the liturgy and so forth, yeah, Michael, Gabriel, Raphael. Yes. Are there other archangels? Oh, yes. There are nine choirs of angels. Now, this comes to us from the, some of the ancient fathers of the church, the writings of um, Pseudo Dionysius, uh, the fathers of the church, especially uh, the patristic fathers and some of the uh, medieval fathers, they didn't um, reject that, that there are nine choirs of angels, nine specific categories of angels. There are angels, archangels, you know, choirs, thrones, dominations, principalities, and so forth, nine. I'll probably forget some, so I won't even try to make sure I get them all. All right, this fall, our parish is going to have a new program started in New Jersey. What is your opinion of the program? Well, I don't know enough about it. Now, I've heard things, positive and negative. Uh, I've heard a lot of negative, but I don't know. You know, one of the things an educated person often has to say, and not be afraid to say, is, I don't know. You know? You, can you say that? I don't know. Very often we don't. So I'm not that familiar with that program, and so I can't tell you about that. It reminds me of an old Bishop Sheen joke. I'm always telling old Bishop Sheen jokes. One time he was preaching out where I live in California at a major university, and he was talking about Jonah being in the belly of the whale for three days, and a heckler in back of the auditorium shouted out, How do you know? Jonah was in the belly of the whale for three days. And Bishop Sheen says, well, I don't know. But when I get to heaven, I shall ask him. And the heckler said, well, what if he isn't there? And he said, well, then you ask him. Can adding regular water to holy water and regular salt to blessed salt continue its effect? Well, that's an old question that comes up every time I do question and answer. No. That's an old wives' tap. If you run out of holy water, get more holy water. You know, it's like, I don't know what people think that is. They used to say that, okay? But no. Get more holy water. You know, that, that's all. You know, you've got only two drops of holy water, so you, you bring in the fire truck and put it in there, and it's all holy water. Nope. Mm -mm. No. No, get more holy water. If God didn't create evil, he is so all-knowing, so uh, he knew that Lucifer would cause all this terrible evil. Now, God knew that from all eternity, and yet God still gave Lucifer, and I might add us, a free will. Why did he bother? God wanted us to be his friends freely. He didn't want to coerce us. Yeah, but why did God permit such a horrible evil as Satan and the fallen angel? And now, you can answer that question and every time they say, why did God allow this evil, that evil, the, all, the other evil, every evil? The answer is the same every single time. In order to bring a greater good out of it. No devil, no great conflict. No devil, no great saints. You know, let's say that you as a parent wanted to, uh, you got seven... Seven sons, God help you. And, and you want them all to be good football players. 
And so you only allow your sons to play against teams whose members weigh no more than 60 pounds in order that your sons will be great football players. Not much of a victory, right? Now, God allows us to fight it out with a ferocious enemy, but he's the power behind us. Let me tell you something I know for sure. I'm nothing. I know that for sure. I'm a speck of dust. I am a human being, sinful, weak, inclined towards sin. The devil's smarter than me, and he's stronger than me. And when he gnashes his teeth, and he tells me that he's going to get me in hell forever, and that I don't have a chance, in all my littleness, and all my weakness, and all my sinfulness, I can spit straight in his eye. You know why? Because God is on my side. I can't whip him with my own power. But my daddy's big and bad and kicks butt. And so, devil, watch out. You better be afraid of me. But I got a big, bad father. And he's coming to get you. All right. How are we created in the image of God? What is the image we are created in? Jesus is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. What constitutes the essential nature of this image? Intellect and free will. Those two things are the major factors. That's what invo is involved in the image and likeness of God. God is pure intellect. God's essence is to exist. He's pure life. We are created in his image and likeness. We're not pure life. We are contingent being. We rely upon God for everything. I can't take my next breath without Almighty God's providential care for me. So it's intellect and free will. That's what makes us in the image and likeness of God. Father, is the devil behind pot, marijuana? Uh, I, I often, I will have questions uh, quite often from young people, and they're very sincere questions, and they're good questions. And they often involve drugs. And, and, and one kid was really smart. You know, there's always one in the group. He's about 15, and he said, well, I read in the, in the Bible, Father, where it said, God created no destructive drug in all creation. That means I can smoke a little dope, right? Wrong. It does say that in the Bible, by the way. And God created nothing evil. Well, didn't God create those little marijuana plants? How about them coca plants? Yeah? How about those opium poppies? God created all of them, didn't he? You bet. Then I can do that, right? Wrong. There is a proper use for everything in creation. Now, there is a, even though there's a debate on it, there is probably a medical use. I'm not sure what it is, but there's probably a medical use for, for a lot of these drugs, there certainly is for the things derived from opium, right? We know that a lot of painkillers that are used for uh, terminally ill people or for people that have surgery, that's a legitimate use. You know, cocaine used to be used for very delicate eye surgery uh, to numb and still the, uh, the blinking reflex so that they could perform. Now they have better uh, things, pharmaceutical things, that they can use. But yeah, everything in, in creation has a legitimate use, not abuse, use, I say. There are many things that can be abused. You know, well, water is a great thing. Uh, I like to drink it. I don't mind swimming in it. My dog loves to swim in it. Water is a great thing. But I don't recommend that you drink any more than a thousand gallons at a sitting. That's called drowning, right? <laughs> everything has its proper use, everything, even good things. Don't eat 93 pork chops for dinner tomorrow night. I guarantee you, don't do that. You're going to have problems, okay? So is the devil behind marijuana? Yeah, he can use it. He's an opportunist. 
He can take even good things and abuse them. He can inspire us to abuse them. Why? We want them to feel good. You know, most of the people that did cocaine in Hollywood, in Los Angeles, they didn't feel good about themselves, including me. Uh, they wanted to feel this euphoric feeling for a little while. They didn't want to have all their inhibitions impeding their joy. And so they smoked some dope, snorted some cocaine, and they thought that was going to solve their problems. Their problems got immediately worse. What goes up must come down and does with a resounding crash. In my last year in Los Angeles, 12 people I personally knew died as the direct result of cocaine. About half of them died of heart attacks. It gets in your heart, and it starts it racing. You just have a heart attack. Heart muscle can't take it. And cocaine stays in the heart muscle for at least 24 hours, and you're in danger of a heart attack or a stroke during that period of time. The other half of them died from suicide. The down was so bad, so distressing, so depressing, they, six of them blew their brains out. They couldn't take it. It was so horrible. They'd done it one too many times. Is a rosary five decades or 15? All of the above. Uh, the whole rosary is 15 decades, but usually mo we say five decades at a time. You know, we might say, you know, the joyful mysteries on Monday and the, the uh, sorrowful mysteries on Tuesday. Most people say five. Is that okay? Sure it is. is the, what's the entire rosary? Well, it's 15 decades. But, you know, the five decades, sure, that's the rosary also. Okay. Five or 15, do it. Please explain. If we have dominion over the angels, who said that? Who said we have dominion over the angels? I didn't. Somebody misunderstood me. We don't have dominion over the angels. How is it that they, the angels, are superior to us? The angels are superior to us in virtue of their higher nature, their nature which clo more closely approximate the nature of the Creator, God, their pure spiritual essences. Do we have dominion, power over the angels? No. No. They are higher than us. Uh, God says, you better listen to my angel. I, ang my, I send my angel before you. He has my authority residing in him. You better listen to him. Now, do we have a certain authority against the fallen angel? In Jesus' name, we do. Yes, in that case. But we don't have a higher nature than the angelic nature. You mentioned sacraments give grace. Do you discourage your teenage and adult children not to receive communion at Mass if they do not go to Mass regularly? except holidays, special occasions. They go to communion voluntarily. Look, let me tell you what I encourage. I encourage what the church encourages. I encourage people to go to Holy Communion, yes, but not in mortal sin. You got the difference? Yes, by all means, teenage kids, go to Mass and go to Holy Communion. To miss Mass on a Sunday or Holy Day of obligation without a legitimate reason is still a mortal sin. You don't believe me? Look it up in the Catechism of the Catholic Church. It's right there. It says it right there. To voluntarily, willfully miss Mass on Sundays or Holy Days of obligation without a good reason, that's a mortal sin. Well, what's that mean? It means you've got to go to confession. Go to confession before you go to communion. Now, in the old days, that's a no-brainer. We all knew that, right? Nowadays, there's a lot of confusion. Well, it's still a no-brainer, but because of the confusion, a lot of people don't know what to do. Do I encourage frequent communion? Oh, yes, absolutely. Go to Mass every Sunday. Uh, if you can, go more than that. But at least you must go on Sunday. As a Catholic, we have a precept, a moral precept that we, requires us to assist at Mass on Sundays and Holy Days of Obligation. Uh, if you miss without a good reason, go to confession. You've got to go to confession. The only ordinary means that the Church knows of the forgiveness of serious sin after baptism is sacramental confession. Now, that's the only ordinary means. 
there are extraordinary means. If God forbid tomorrow flying home on the airplane, uh, the engine goes out and we start heading for the ground fast, a person might say quick act of contrition. Does that work? Yes. That's an extraordinary means. What would actually happen is I'd give everybody conditional general absolution. If you're able, I absolve you from your sins in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Everyone on that airplane who was so disposed in their heart would receive that absolution. But if the plane pulled out of it, they'd have an obligation to go to individual confession and receive individual absolution before they ever got general absolution again. Now, that's a precondition for the validity of the sacrament. A lot of places that have general absolution. They don't tell the people. As a condition of validity, you must go to individual confession and confess those sins that were already supposedly taken care of in general absolution. You've got an obligation to go confess them individually anyway, later, before you ever go and receive general absolution again. People don't know that, but that's a condition of validity. Do people get more grace or blessings from a mass depending on the holiness of the priest? No. The sacraments operate in virtue of their own power. All right? Good thing. We screw up. Hey, we're human. You know, we priests are sinners. Well, you know, it can easily happen that a priest messes up. So if the priest is not an exemplar of holiness, which, of course, we're called to be that, we should be, but if we're not, if we fall short, uh, does that somehow prevent you from receiving all the grace? You said, no. The sacraments operate in virtue of their own power. Ex opera operato, as the saying goes. Now, the holiness of priests is a very definite factor, though, in the holiness of the people. It's very important. But, but to answer that question, no, don't worry about that. That was an old heresy, by the way, that said that. If the priest isn't holy, the people don't receive grace. No, that's a heresy. You get the grace. Why does the archangel Raphael hold a fish? See, he has a fish from the book of Tobit. You're, you're going to look up in your Bible... Shake the dust off it and look up in your Bible, the book of Tobit, and read the story of how the archangel Raphael was the angel guide and how he liberated Tobias and his fiance from the power of that evil spirit. That's why he's holding the fish. He used the gall of that fish. He burned it as incense, and that chased the demon away. It was a sacramental. Okay, look it up. Read that in the Bible. Once you have blessed this water... Can it be added to other water? Well, we already answered that one. No. Is there any difference between the Tan Catechism and the new green second edition? Well, there are minor differences. They're essentially the same. There are some minor differences. Uh, don't worry too much about it. It concerns the teaching on uh, what, capital punishment, the fifth commandment, um, which, they, you know, capital punishment is something that nowadays the Holy Father said there's scarcely a reason for it because we have a way, nowadays, we can incarcerate criminals so that they're no threat to society. And that's true. Um, and so there's scarcely a reason for the death penalty. Now, when McVeigh was executed, you know, I mean, that brought a lot of that to the forefront of thinking. Uh, but do governments have the right to impose the death penalty, yes, to protect society, yes. That's an old teaching of the church. But nowadays, there's scarcely a, a reason for them because they're not a threat. You know, you can lock them up, and you, you might say, well, I don't want to pay for it, though. You know, well, okay. You know, but um, that, that slight change there in the teaching in the Fifth Commandment, but it's essentially the same. The catechism's the same. Yesterday, you said there are four ways to get into trouble with the devil. I, heard, I only heard you state three of them. Okay, and the first case is where you have an innocent person and God permits them to be afflicted by the devil. Second case, uh, you may also have an innocent victim who is the victim of a curse 
or a spell. And God also permits that. It's very rare. That doesn't usually happen, but it can happen if God permits it. In the third case, you may have a person living in perpetual, habitual, mortal sin without repentance. That's the most common. You're just asking for it then. You know, you're just saying, come on, devil, uh, make a mess out of me. And he will. Now, the fourth one, which you didn't hear, is associating with evil persons, places, or things. Going to seances. Hmm? Uh, astrology, which seems so innocent, but isn't. Uh, Ouija boards. All of these things are occult practices. Consulting with fortune tellers. Uh, going to a witch. Um, um, Santa Maria, the use of a lot of uh, things for voodoo rituals where they take even uh, sacramentals, crucifixes, rosaries, and use them in, in uh, rituals. That, that's associating with evil persons, places, or things. Uh, in other words, you soak in some manure long enough, you're going to come out smelling funny. Don't do it. Don't do it. Okay? All right. Father, why has given why has God given the devil so much power? Well, that the victory might be greater. In plain English, that the victory might be greater. Why why God why evil? Why does evil have so much power? That the victory of the saints might be greater. I remember a couple football games I played in. God, I could hardly walk when they were over with. I remember once we played uh, Christian Brothers Academy, which was the arch rivalry. And the, whoa, they were tough. And we knocked heads with them for four quarters of football. There were injuries. People were being carried off the field, both sides, every play. And I mean it. Every play, somebody's getting carried off the field. It was brutal, deadly. Man, we won in the last minute. We won in the last one, not by no field goal either. We didn't do that in my day very much. You ran over somebody and got the stinking ball in the end zone. Place kickers weren't the highest scorers in my league. Anyway, we went in the locker room, and it was the greatest victory ever. We felt like we were half dead. Man, we had, some of us had broken bones, blood. Bruises everywhere. Oh, it was glorious. <laughs> that was great. Mud and all over, mud hanging out of your face mask, grass. Oh, it was great. <laughs> best game I ever played in. I almost got killed, but it was the best game I ever played. That's why, the God, that's why God allows the devil to have so much power. Better game. <laughs> More deadly form of combat. But it's a better, you know, yeah, when you win that one, you know you, win, you won something. <laughs> Same thing in, when in, I was in, you know, in a boxing match. Boy, I'd be in with a tough guy, and the whole fight, I didn't know who's going to win that. Went right the distance, all the way. And in the last minute, it came right down to who had the most left, and who had, you go on sheer guts. You don't have any wind left, you don't have any strength in your arms, but you go on sheer willpower and you win, right at the end. It's close, but you win. And the victory is that much greater. That's why. You said that the devil couldn't hurt us even if we were not in sin. What about, oh, Padre Pio? Well, I already answered that. God permitted it for his greater glory. Does God use suffering, sickness, and affliction for reparation if the person doesn't offer it up to God to be joined with the cross. Now, that is a very astute question, a very good, insightful question. Yes, God does permit that, and it can be efficacious. How, though? Well, I'll give you an example. My father didn't have and probably doesn't have a clue, even though he's listened to me preach, he probably doesn't really know what his suffering is all about. Is it still efficacious? Yeah. It is. I offer it up for him. You know? If you know... Now, the other thing is it can be very efficacious. Let's say, was all the pain and suffering I went through, even when I was in mortal sin, was that efficacious? 
Yes. Yes. Why? Because it had an instructive purifying dimension to it. It wasn't a function of sanctifying grace. I wasn't able to receive sanctifying grace. I was in mortal sin. But did it do me any good? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, an obstinate person can profit greatly from getting their butt kicked. We know that from common experience. And, and, and it's true. Oh, yeah, God can use that, even if the person doesn't know. Please explain how to avoid being deceived by the devil. Thank you. Be humble. Be humble. That's the only way I know of. Listen to the church, of course, but humility is the greatest safeguard. Greatest safeguard. I can tell you of a case when I was a novice. There was a woman who used to come to all the religious things we had at the monastery. She seemed to be a pious woman. She was in her 50s, a widow, very nice-looking woman, quite wealthy. And she would come to Mass every day. She'd come to the Stations of the Cross, the Rosary, and so forth. And one day she came up to me and she said, Brother, she said, Our Lady is appearing to me, you know. And I said, Is she? And she said, Oh, yes. And she was quite proud of the fact. And she said, what, When she comes next time, what do you think I should say to her? And I said, well, the next time she comes, say to her, in the name of Jesus, be gone. And she said, what? I said, oh, yeah. Why would I say that? Hey, the saints told us that they could easily be deceived. Often the devil would, would come. Clothed as an angel of light. Often the devil come looking like the Blessed Mother. He can't do that. Oh, yes, he can. And he does. So the next time she comes, say, get out of here. And she became furious. Well, you've got to test the spirits. Well, she was furious. How dare you insinuate that the devil could come to me? And she marched off in a terrible huff. Well, two, three months later, one of the brothers came to me with a whole box full of letters. Uh, this woman had been writing him letters. I read them. Now, look, I have seen everything in my life. I have heard everything in my life. Nothing can scandalize me. These letters were pure pornography. I mean, they were lurid. And the brother, well, he's a good boy. He was a good, good man. And, and, but it kind of upset him. We sent him out of town, to be honest with you. We shipped him to another city. We're not going to take any chances. Well, that told me a little something. Three months later, I found out that there was a, a full coven of witches operating in that area. Thirteen covens constitute a full coven. Guess who the chief witch was? Yep. Guess what gave it away to me when she was too proud to humble herself to the reality that she could be deceived. Great saints like Teresa of Avila were quick to exclaim that if it wasn't for good, stern spiritual direction, they would have been easy targets for the devil. Even a saint and doctor of the church said that. So don't think that you and I are beyond deception. What's the best dis defense humility pure and simple be humble why didn't jesus forgive adam and eve and let them stay in paradise jesus did forgive adam and eve but he booted them out of paradise because they had to learn a lesson. And so did all of us. God did not abandon humanity. But humanity was launched into a battle. And our glory in heaven will be much greater than it would have been without the battle. Why did God permit it? But God could have said, okay, Adam and Eve, you're forgiven. Just stay here and, uh, you know, eat some more flowers or 
whatever they did. You know, they couldn't in, in those days before the fall. You know, you couldn't eat moose meat because uh, there was no. You know, there was uh, they didn't eat meat. They just ate plants and stuff. That was one of the better effects of the fall. You know, now you can eat T-bone steaks and not worry about it. Well, no, God, okay, God did forgive our first parents. He did forgive them. Uh, he didn't uh, uh, totally curse them. Uh, he stayed with, the, didn't he stay with their progeny, the, the chosen people, the Israelite people? Sure, God was with them. He went with Moses and the people through the desert. God was with the whole history of humanity. He didn't abandon us. However, he said, okay, there are consequences to your actions. Okay, you don't listen to me, all right. I forgive you. But you're going to now have to learn the hard way. You're going to have to work by the sweat of your brow if you're going to eat now. And then that battle was joined. But our later glory, will be much greater than our former glory. Why? As the result of the battle, as the result of the incarnation and redemption. If there is a purgatory, why did Jesus tell the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in paradise? Well, does everybody go to purgatory? No. What is purgatory? Purgatory is the final purification. In other words, you don't do it now, you'll do it later. Every penny will be paid. The temporal punishment due to sin, Jesus said it. Every penny will be paid. Now, you can do it here, or you can do it later. A lot of people suffer a great deal in this life, and they go straight to heaven. I once baptized a mafia boss. I was preaching in New York, and two large guys came up to me after the sermon, and they said, uh, Mr. So-and-so, whose name ended in a vowel, <laughs> would like to see you. And I knew who he was. I recognized their name right off. Been in the newspapers. He was dying. I said, why on earth do you want to see me? So I went. They took me to a big mansion in Long Island. And he said to me, he's in bed, dying of cancer, and he said, look, I need to be baptized. I wasn't baptized. Now, all Italians in those days were baptized. I mean, that just, uh, nobody, everybody got baptized. Now, whether or not he was baptized or not, I didn't know. But you can do a conditional baptism. You can't repeat the sacrament of baptism, but you can do a conditional baptism. If you are not baptized, I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So he said, okay, if you'll do it. I said, yeah, you, you, you have faith. You, you want to repent of your sins and so on. Oh, yeah, yeah. He said, but I've been an awful bad man. He said, there's ten commandments. He said, yeah. He said, well, I broke all of them. You know, if there were 11, I would have done that too. He said, but can I be forgiven? You know, somebody wrote a question, could McVeigh be forgiven? Of, of course. Is there any sin God couldn't forgive? God, the only unforgivable sin is final impenitence. Okay, you got that? The only unforgivable sin is final impenitence. God can and will forgive any and every sin. There is no sin too horrible to be forgiven. McVeigh received anointing of the sick, you know that, before he was executed. Uh, sometimes those things have a positive side to them. Now, could McVeigh, though, you think he could be saved? Sure. If he was sorry for his sins, if he repented, turned to God, received, absolutely. That mafia guy said to me, well, what happens? I says, well, look, when I pour that water on you and I say I baptize you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, original sin is washed away. All your personal sins of your whole life are washed away. And all the temporal punishment due to sin is immediately washed away. He said, well, what does that mean exactly? I said, that means that if you die without committing any more sins, you get on the elevator and go straight up. He said, no. I said, yeah. 
He said, it don't seem quite fair. <laughs> you mean to tell me I had a lifetime of crime and horrible sin, and you're going to just pour some water on me? And I'm going to go straight to heaven if I don't commit any more sin? That's it, brother. A lot of people don't like that, you know. They say, hey, I've been good all my life. That bum, he comes at the last minute. God's going to let him in? Yep. Not fair. Who said so? God's the boss, remember? He can do whatever he wants. You remember the parable from the gospel? The guy, the workers, they came, and they wanted to work out in the, in the fields, and, and so the master of the field, he hired them, each one at a different hour. They came right to the end. There's still a couple guys there hanging around the city square. Well, what a guy, well, you, well, we didn't get hired. All right, go out and work in my fields. They worked for an hour. Everybody came back at the end for pay. They all got the same thing. The guys that had been there since early in the morning complained, hey, you promised us that you'd give us this much money for a day's work. And you, and, and you gave the same thing to them. He said, so? My money, I gave you what I promised you. Don't worry about them. And don't you worry about the guy who comes at the last minute. God is perfectly just and perfectly merciful. Father, which exorcism prayer may be said by the faithful laypersons? How about the Our Father? Deliver us from evil. Very powerful, you know. Deliver us, the, the real, the original, the authentic translation, is deliver us from the evil one. That's what it says. Deliver us from evil. Uh, you can say the St. Michael prayer. St. Michael, the archangel, deliver us from evil. That's what you can do. Now, the exorcisms, like in the, um, in the old Roman ritual, you know you can't do that. No. You can't do that. Only a priest can do that. Not even, not even a deacon can do that. It's serious business, and the church takes seriously uh, that particular form of combat. What do you think of centering prayer? I don't know. Not going to get into it. I don't know enough about it. There is a form of prayer that's very ancient that goes back to the Desert Fathers. Uh, it's very, very healthy. It's very good. The Jesus prayer, for instance. Lord Jesus Christ. Son of the living God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And, and they said it over and over again. It's not a mantra, but you repeat it. Lord Jesus Christ, son of, or maybe shorten it. Lord Jesus, Son of God, have mercy on me, a sinner. That's called the Jesus prayer. It's very ancient. It was repeated many, many times, hundreds, thousands of times. The desert fathers would say it from their places of penance in the desert. Uh, very, very uh, powerful. But the centering prayer, as Father Basil Pennington writes about it. I'm not, you know, I'm not going to say, a lot of people want me to say something bad about it. You know, they think I'm going to, maybe it's New Age or something. Uh, I'm just, you know, I'm not going to get into it because I'm not an expert on it, very honestly. And so I, I just, I really, somebody else could probably give you, maybe Father Mitch Pacwa, probably give you a much better answer than I could about that. I'm just being honest. What kind of feeling are we to have towards Satan? Sorrow? Hate? Love of an enemy? What? That was a good question. Good question. I can just, I, I can give you, I can't give you an absolute answer, but I can make some commentary on it based upon what I know, what I've read in Scripture and so forth. Um, don't be afraid of him. Don't let him bully you. Uh, don't go around trying to tweak his nose either. You know? Uh, I have a very good gentle dog. Don't try to take his meat out of his pan, okay? They, they, you can go just so far with him. Now, the devil is a fallen angel and had the great dignity of one of those closest to God through a tragedy, his own free will. He fell from grace. Uh, I have in the, I, you know, do you hate the devil? Probably not. Do you have sorrow for him? Probably not. Do you love him? Hell no. In plain English. Excuse me. Well, but you're supposed to love your enemies, not that one. 
He has no chance. His choice was irrevocable. Okay? But don't get smart with him either. I've got a healthy respect for the enemy. Okay? That doesn't mean I'm afraid of him, but that doesn't mean I mock him. Uh, don't mock the devil. Don't do that. I mean, you don't have to be scared of him. You don't have to go tippy-tone around. But I would not do that because God is just apt to humble you and let you get the snot knocked out of you once just to teach you a thing or two. I mean it. Now, and I've seen it happen. Oh, I've seen it happen. So have a, a healthy uh, respect. When I say that, hey, keep your distance. Don't be afraid of him. Don't, ha don't hate him. Don't love him. Just keep your distance. He's the enemy. Treat him like an enemy. You'll be all right. Now, will you comment on stem cell research, please? Well, listen. I, I'll come. Yeah, I'll comment on it a little bit. Uh, people also ask about cloning. You know, and a lot of these technological things. I can respond to it by saying, not everything that we can do should we do. There are many things that are technologically possible, amazing things are technologically possible. But once you get a little bit too close to what is God's province, watch out. Cloning, dangerous. Dangerous. I don't know what you're going to end up with. You know, stem cell research, what, if you're going to use the fetuses of aborted children? God help us. God help us. You know, one distortion leads to another. One injustice leads to another. One abuse of the gifts we're given leads to another and another and another. Uh, what do I say about all of it? Watch out. Watch out that we don't create a monster in a manner of speaking. I don't mean that literally. But by playing God, watch out. Okay? How do we handle a daughter who has been married, has two children, and is gay? She is in a relationship. Um, let's see. We, uh, he, we told her that we do not approve of this relationship, but we love her. Okay. You did a good thing. There are many people that come under this category of gay, homosexual relations, lesbian relations. All right, now I'm going to say to you what I have always said. Now, I, I get misquoted and misunderstood, but I'm going to say the same thing I've always said. God loves every human being, everyone. Um, uh, that analogy I gave you, love the sinner, hate the sinner. If my brother contracts cancer, I don't stop loving him because of the cancer. I love him even more. If I have the mind and heart of Christ, I might want to suffer for him. I might want to relieve him of his suffering somehow. How does God approach these people, any person living objectively in sin? God approaches them with mercy and with love. We must do the same. But how, how, how should you treat them? Let me tell you something. With you as a mom or dad, whatever the case may be, I've got very little doubt that your daughter doesn't know exactly how you feel. I don't think there's any danger that you're going to give scandal to your daughter by loving her and making her think that you are in favor of lesbianism. Uh, she's not going to start th thinking that about you. She knows very well you don't accept it, nor should you. That is an intrinsic evil. However, you must accept your daughter or your son. You don't have to accept the sin, but you must accept the person. You must love that person. We all must. We all must. We can't be bigoted, prejudiced, afraid. It doesn't mean that we acquiesce to sin. We don't say it's okay if it's not. But you've got to love the person and you've got to pray. You've got to be sympathetic and patient. And that involves a cross. That's very, very difficult. But it's something we've got to do. One more quick one. 
Did anyone ever find out who it was that prayed with Mother Angelica when she had the healing? Hey, I was there. I was in the room. I was the guest on the show that night. You asked the right person. Yeah, I was there. My mom was there, too. And Father Fox, Father Robert Fox, was there that night. The lady's name was Paola. She's from Italy. She has a healing gift. I had dinner with her the night before and that night. And after Mother Angelica Live, I was the guest on the show. Paula said, can we pray the rosary? And Mother said, okay, we'll go in my office. And we went in Mother's office and began to pray the rosary. Now, um, Paula didn't understand English, and Mother can't pray in Italian. And so we said, well, Mother said, let's pray in Latin. So we'll say the rosary in Latin. And so we did. Around the third mystery, Paula starts talking. Like you're talking to your next door neighbor. Yeah, but she's talking in Italian, but I could understand some of it. And it goes like this. Yeah, but Mama, she's got a lot to do. She's got a lot of responsibility. She reaches a lot of people. You know, she can't be hobbling around like this. Well, you've got to relieve her of this suffering, you know. You've got to take this away. And you've got to do it right away. Well, that's just a conversation. Well, Paula turns to Mother and says, Hey, would you do me a favor? Could I pray over you? Now, Mother has been through this a gazillion times. And she's patient and good, but she never asked for a healing. That affliction was a powerful thing that breathed life into what she does. But she's just, like I said, patient. She said, okay, okay. She didn't expect anything. So Paula prays. And then she prays again. And they said, would you do me a favor, she said. Mother said, what, dear? She said, would you take off the braces? And I know I can imagine what Mother was thinking. Now, Mother can be very patient and very sweet and kind, but it goes just so far. And I was waiting for it, you know. I was waiting to see where it was going to shift into overdrive. And, and so I could see her kind of say, okay. And she got up, and the predictable happened. Her legs turned to absolute rubber. She couldn't control her legs. She started wobbling. We had to catch her. And so Paul said, no, no, try again. Harder. Just stand up there and walk now. Oh, like a rough old m mother pushing her kids. Now you just walk now. What do you think this is? Well, Mother took a couple wobbly steps. No big deal. I want to tell you, I didn't for a minute think she was healed of anything. Put the braces back on, went back upstairs, and she said as she was kind of walking into the cloister, she felt a um, heat in her legs, and she knew something was going on. She didn't know what. Well, the next thing I knew about it was the next morning. Uh, I was going to celebrate Mass, and I was going to preach the homily, at the Mass on EWTN that morning. One of the extern nuns waylaid me coming into the uh, sacristy and says, uh, come on, you got to come here. Mother wants to talk to you before Mass. And so I go into the parlor where the, uh, the bars are and the nuns are on the other side. And there's Mother in there with one of the sisters. And she said, get a load of this. And she starts doing a waltz around the uh, parlor with the nun. And they, they're waltzing around the thing. Well, at Mass, uh, her braces were up next to the monstrance, you know, over where the grate, where they received communion. I saw them up there, and the priest who came, who was celebrating Mass, he came to give communion. And the nuns, he almost fell over. And he saw Mother coming up there without any braces or anything. He noticed it. Mother then, after Mass, went out into the parking lot and did the same dance around the parking lot for all the people that had been in Mass. Um, later, the back brace came off. And then uh, she got herself some combat boots. She went, it was the funniest thing. She went to the shoe store, and she was going to get some new shoes. Because all of her shoes for 40 years had the built-in metal braces in them, right? So she had to go get her some normal shoes. So she went and looked, and, and the guy says, um, what size shoe do you wear? She said, um, uh, I think it was eight triple A, very narrow feet. And the guy comes. He couldn't even begin to get it on her foot. And up, 8D. 
said, that's impossible. I've been wearing the same shoes for 40 years. I don't know what D with. Now you do. I don't know why. When I get to heaven, I shall ask God. Now Mother Angelica has fat feet. But they work very well. Her name was Paula, to answer your question. And that's the end of that. God bless you, and goodbye.